GIP 16 is the making of the goddess of liberty and democracy. I've mostly avoided in this series giving over any large part of any of the lectures to autobiographical materials, showing photographs of myself and others and talking about my past. A few lectures that are devoted to that will eventually be included in still a third series, which we think of titling Pages from My Notebook. But I'm going to make an exception for this one, which is on the one hand about an art historical event. In fact, the greatest meeting of art and history in our time, I think, and an event in which I was a kind of long distance participant in that the best and the only truly firsthand account of it was written by my wife, Xing Yuan Zhao, and it was transcribed and somewhat rewritten and supplemented by myself from her verbal narrative. In the spring of 1989, Xing Yuan went back to Beijing to spend six months working in the library of the Institute of Chinese Art History that she was attached to. Housed then in the old Prince Gung's mansion, located northwest of the Palace Museum. Now it's become a tourist attraction. I was supposed to join her in Beijing, but sometime in late May, after the students had begun their occupation of Tiananmen Square, she wired me not to come. And so I experienced the terrible three days of the shootings and all the rest, not feeling able to contact her, watching it all happen on TV. She did manage to get out after going through experiences that she tells in three Beijing chronicles that she dictated to me after her return. I think of putting those also on my website for their historical value and share human interest the next. Among the stories she had to tell, the one that's the subject of this lecture is the making of the goddess of liberty and democracy. Xing Yuan was living in her old quarters, the Central Academy of Fine Arts, still situated at that time behind Wang Pujing, not far from the square, Tiananmen Square. So she was able to watch at first hand all the events recounted in her essay. Next. Her account of the making of the goddess was published in several places after she came back, and if you Google the goddess today, you find versions of her narrative either copied directly from the one published under her name, often misspelled in these derived versions, or cribbed from it, sometimes with a footnote sending readers to the real source. The point is that she was the only person who actually accompanied the young sculptors who made the sculpture during much of the time of its creation the transporting of it to the square and setting it up. She was with them and took part in the dedication ceremony, and she went off with them afterwards for a celebratory dinner together. As a sculptor herself, she was, in short, almost accepted as one of them, although she couldn't actually take part in making it. So the account she gives is the only first-hand account of this monumental event that there is or can be unless one of the young sculptors who created it decides in his later life to tell his version of the story. And so far as I know, none of them has. Next. I have the original handwritten notes on yellow paper that I scribbled out as she told her story, and an old marked-up copy of the typescript of her story as I typed it out, under the title, A Beijing Chronicle, An Account of My Experiences in Beijing, from April into early June 1989 by Zhao Xingyuan, transcribed by James Cahill. Part 2, The Birth of the Goddess of Democracy, The Real Story. I will mostly be reading excerpts from that while showing photographs that she made and interjecting some explanatory comments by myself as we go on. The photographs were not made to accompany any narrative, and they can only be matched up with, with hers in the loosest way, as we'll try to do. Nothing excites a sculptor so much ordinarily as seeing a work of her own creation take shape. This time, however, I was watching the creation of a sculpture that I had no part in making, and feeling the same excitement. It was the Goddess of Democracy statue that stood for five days in Tiananmen Square, from May 30th to the morning of June 4th. I witnessed the making of it, and I want to put the story on record. I myself was, until July of 1988, a graduate student at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, where the sculpture was made, and I was living there when these events took place. 
Since I was trained as a sculptor before becoming an art historian, I have been especially close to the faculty and students of the Central Academy Sculpture Department, and I was looked on by the students as a kind of older sister. The reason I did not participate directly in the making of the statue was that my own status, I am now living mostly abroad with a foreign husband, might have made trouble for these students if I had taken part. I might even have been identified as one of the small group of instigators and, quote, people with ulterior motives whom the government was attempting to charge with responsibility for the demonstrations. So I avoided conspicuous involvement, adopting the role of observer and supportive friend. Part 2. By the 27th of May, a week after the declaration of martial law in Beijing, the student movement seemed to be losing some of its momentum. The students suspected that the government was waiting for them to tire and leave the square by their own choice. The word got around that on the evening of the 29th, there would be an important announcement on the central broadcasting station, and it was expected to be the resignation of Zhao Ziyang, the Federation of Beijing University Students, which was coordinating the movement, decided that as a response to this broadcast, they would stage the largest demonstration of all, involving students, workers, residents of Beijing, everyone, after which they would all return to their units. And they decided to leave behind in the square, as they stand in for themselves, a monumental work of art that would continue so long as it was allowed to stand to assert their symbolic presence and their ideals. And here I interject. Zhao Ziyang, mentioned in her account, represents the faction of good guys in my book. He had come to the U.S. and stopped at UC Berkeley, where it was arranged for five or six of us, high-ranking faculty in Chinese studies, to have coffee with him and talk. And I was deeply impressed with the way he spoke, in good English, by the way, about China's future. The people working with him were liberal-minded and technologically savvy, and if he had prevailed, China would now be a very different place, and a lot better. Instead, it was the awful Li Peng and the hardline party elders who prevailed, and who persuaded Deng Xiaoping to deal harshly with the students. On May 19th, Zhao Ziyang emerged from a meeting in the Great Hall of the People's Congress onto Tiananmen Square to announce to the students that he had lost, he had failed, and to urge them to give up and go home. They did not take his advice. His failure and the disappearance into house arrest for his remaining years was a great tragedy for China. Others who were trying to mediate between the students and the government, such as Liu Xiaobo, later to win a Nobel Prize while he was, and still is for that matter, in prison, for speaking out the truth about what China needs, they too lost out. The bad guys won, and a tragedy of the kind that bad guys impose on their societies followed. Now back to Xinguan's account. Part 3. Students and faculty of the Central Academy of Fine Arts, which is located only a short distance from Tiananmen Square, had from the beginning been actively involved in the demonstrations. It was students in their oil painting department who in the first days, when a major objective of the movement was to honor the recently deceased Hu Yaobang, had made a huge oil painting of him that propped up against the monument to the people's heroes in the square. On May 27th, a representative of the Federation of Beijing University Students came to the Central Academy to ask that they produce another large-scale work of art, this time a statue and that it be ready by the time of the great demonstration on the 30th. That gave them three days in which to do it. The Federation offered them 8,000 yuan, that is over $2,000 U.S. by the official rate, for materials and other expenses. The undergraduate students in three of the four studios of the Central Academy's uh, sculpture department agreed to take on the job. There were about 15 of them, all young men in their early 20s, part four. The Federation suggested that the sculpture be a replica of the Statue of Liberty in New York, like the smaller one that had been carried in a procession by demonstrators in Shanghai two days earlier. But the Central Academy sculpture students rejected that idea, 
both because it might be taken as too openly pro-American and because copying an existing work was contrary to their principles as creative artists. They rejected also the suggestion of a Chinese-style work because there is no tradition in China for sculpture that expresses powerfully a political concept. To do a statue in the manner of Buddhist cave sculpture might have been more pleasing to foreign viewers, such as the art news critic who complained that the goddess of liberty looked too Western, but it would have sacrificed the emotional impact that the statue was to have on the great mass of people for whom it was made. Part 5. What was called for, the students felt, was a new work of universal appeal, Chinese only in the eclectic way that China sometimes borrows what it needs from foreign cultures. But apart from style, they had another problem, the short time in which they had to complete it. How could an original, monumental work of sculpture be finished in three days, even if they worked through the night? Normally, much longer than that was spent on creating the model, and still more on making the finished work. Their solution was ingenious and explained some features of the statue as it took shape, its slightly off-balance look, and its posture with two hands raised to hold up the torch, for the Statue of Liberty in New York needs only one. The students, with their strong academic training that young artists uh, receive in China, chose a thoroughly academic approach to their problem. They decided to adapt to their purpose a studio practice work that one of them, or perhaps it was several of them, had already made, a half-meter-high clay sculpture of a man grasping a pole with two raised hands and leaning his weight on it. It had been done originally as a demonstration of how the distribution of weight is affected when the center of gravity is shifted outside the body. It had been made first as a nude figure and then draped, with the organic body still perceptible under the drapery. The students knew from their training that a draped figure that is not based on a fully worked out body underneath it would be unconvincing. And here I will interject. Unhappily, she made no photo of this sculpture of a nude man with outspread legs, and it was probably destroyed. It may have looked something like a Rodin sculpture of a walking man seen here, but it also had a head and raised arms grasping a pole. We'll have to imagine it, but her description supplies us with an invaluable account of how the goddess was created, which, so far as I know, has never been told anywhere before. Now, back to her account. This was the unlikely beginning from which the goddess of democracy was to grow by a remarkable process of transformation. The students cut off the lower part of the pole and added a flame at the top to turn it into a torch. They leaned the sculpture into a more upright position, and they changed the man's face for a woman's, added breasts and long hair, and otherwise made him into a her. Part 6. I did not witness this transformation of the model myself, but I was told about it afterwards by the sculptors. They were a bit embarrassed in relating how it happened. They thought of it more as an emergency expedient than as an ingenious or admirable solution. Their aim was to portray the goddess as a healthy young woman, and for that, again, the Chinese sculpture tradition offered no models. What they turned to was the tradition favored within the Central Academy's sculpture department, the Russian school of revolutionary realism, and specifically the style of the woman sculptor Vera Mukina, whose monumental sculpture of a worker and collective farm woman placed originally atop the Soviet pavilion at the 1937 Paris World's Fair, is still much admired in China. The head of the farm woman in this work was the principal inspiration for the face and head of the goddess. And here I interject again. I'm showing photos of the sculpture by Vera Mukina after a photo of the sculptor herself to bring out the closeness of the woman's head to that of the goddess that was copied after it. When one hears of how this sculpture was made, how quickly, with no time for planning, and out of improvised materials and models. It sounds as if the result would be disaster, but somehow it wasn't. It was a kind of masterpiece. This is only one of the extraordinary truths about this amazingly true story. Part 7. 
This transformed model was then made the basis for the 10 meter high statue. It was divided, marked that is, into four horizontal sections, and teams of young sculptors transferred the measurements of these by a process well known to academic sculptors to the corresponding parts of the huge works that would be assembled on the square. The main material was styrofoam plastic. This had not, so far as I know, been used before in China for monumental sculpture, but perhaps the idea had come from foreign sculptors who had used it, or from the use of that material in advertising displays or storefront windows or something like that. Large blocks of it were carved into rough approximations of the shapes desired and then wired together with plaster added to the surface to join the pieces more strongly and to show their modeling. Constructed in this way, the four sections were fairly light. Each could be lifted by five or six students. Part 8. What follows about the actual making of the goddess in the space of three days and nights I will only summarize. Xing Ran tells of how it was made uh, really as a cooperative work with no single person in charge. And she adds this, quote, Anyone who claims now to have been the artist or the organizer or the leader should be regarded with suspicion. From the account I was given by the students themselves, that was not the way it had happened, end quote. And she tells how one young Central Academy faculty member was openly supportive and helped the young students get materials and handled the money for them. Others supported them in other ways. But it was generally true of the Tiananmen student movement that the leaders were mostly undergrads, even freshmen. The more advanced students, not to mention faculty, had too much to lose in their current and future careers to take on the risks that the students were willing to take. Part 9. I was not there through the whole making of the statue. No one was. Sculpture goes slowly and cannot hold the interest of a non-participant for long. I was on the square much of the time the work was going on, doing what I could for the demonstrators and hunger strikers, talking with them, buying things to take to them, food, water, towels, flashlights, and so on. But I would stop by often to see how the statue was progressing and to talk with the sculptors. The work was done in the courtyard where large-scale sculpture was always made in the Central Academy. Teachers living in the buildings surrounding it complained that they couldn't sleep because of the noise since the work continued through the night. There were always onlookers commenting and talking. The Academy's overt attitude toward the making of the sculpture was one of passive toleration not active sanction. That was impossible. But many of the faculty, perhaps most of them, approved quietly. And when the statue was moved to the square, many of them came along to show support. Part 10. When the time came to transport the pieces of the statue to the square, another problem arose. The students had intended to bring them in one of the academy's trucks, but the State Security Bureau, hearing of this, sent word that any driver daring to take them would lose his license. In the end, the students hired six of the familiar Beijing carts, made like a bicycle in front and a flat cart with two wheels behind. Four of these carried the sections of the statue with tools and materials on the other two. Students from the Central Academy, along with others from seven other academies of crafts, drama, music, dance, and so on, who were cooperating, accompanied the carts to guard them. The procession was led by a bearer of the Central Academy's flag, followed by two ranks of strong young people, including myself for part of the way, for protection. Then the six carts, and all of this was surrounded by a hollow rectangle of students marching with us as an outer guard. The route had been announced, turn left outside the Academy gate, then westward to the Dunghua Man, the east gate of the Forbidden City, and so around the road between the wall and the moat to the square. But this was to deceive the police in case they were waiting to stop us. In fact, we turned right out of the academy and followed the shorter route down Wangpujing, the well-known shopping street, turning right along Chang'an Avenue past the Beijing Hotel, part 11. The place on the square where the statue was to be erected had been chosen carefully. It was on the great axis, heavy with symbolism, 
both cosmological and political, that extended from the main entrance of the Forbidden City, with a huge portrait of Mao Zedong over it, through the monument to the People's Heroes, which had become the command headquarters of the student movement, the statue was to be set up just across the broad avenue from Mao, so that it would confront the great leader face to face. When we arrived around 10.30 at night, a huge crowd, perhaps 50,000 people, had gathered around the tall scaffolding of iron poles that had already been erected to support the statue. The parts were placed one on top of another, attached to this frame. Plaster was poured into the hollow core, locking it into a vertical iron pole, which extended from the ground up the center to hold it upright. The exposed iron supports were then cut away, leaving the statue freestanding. It stood on a base also made of iron rods, about two meters in height, which later was covered with cloth. The statue was deliberately made so that once assembled, it could not be taken apart again, but would have to be destroyed all at once. The work continued through the night. A ring of students joined hands around the statue so that those working on it would be undisturbed. I myself went back to the academy to get some sleep, returning to the square next morning. By then it was difficult to get inside the circle of guards. Many people had waited there all night, and too many of them wanted to watch the construction of the statue from close by. Only those involved with making it were to be allowed in. Even students who were to perform music and dance at the unveiling ceremony had to wait outside. I showed my Central Academy of Fine Arts student badge, but the guards only pointed and said, Central Academy students, wait over there. I felt crestfallen, wishing that I hadn't gone back to sleep. Had I missed my chance? But then I waved and shouted at the sculptors working inside. Hey, come and rescue me. Three or four of them came over and told the guards, she's special, let her in. So I got in. Part 12. By noon on the 30th, the statue was ready for the unveiling ceremony. Actually, only the face was veiled by two long pieces of cloth, bright blue and red. The students could never have collected enough cloth to cover the whole figure. Journalists and others who were gathered there had become restless by mid-morning and were showing signs of leaving. I warned the students of this, and I advised them that they should announce the time of the ceremony over the loudspeaker to persuade people to stay. They said, you speak English, why don't you make the announcement? So I did, saying in my best English, ladies and gentlemen, please stay where you are. We will have the unveiling ceremony around 12 noon, end quote. Even that much public speaking left me embarrassed, and the student joshed me. Only those few sentences and her face turns red. The ceremony was simple and very moving. A statement had been prepared about the meaning of the statue, written on a long banner stretched on poles near the statue, and was read over the loudspeaker by a woman, probably a student at the Broadcasting Academy, who had a good Mandarin accent. Like the sculpture itself, the statement was a piece of passionately dedicated improvisation. It was written on the banner in rather crude calligraphy. Here is a rough rendering of it. Dear compatriots and fellow students, we as proud citizens of China have broken the autocracy of the government and now stand welcoming the democracy movement of 1989. All the people are of a single mind to combat bravely the feudal autocracy. Fighting tirelessly through the days and nights of the past weeks, we have achieved victories one after another because the people are invincible. Now this autocratic government, possessing only animal characteristics, lacking all human feeling, has used the most shameless and thoroughless methods, violence and cheating, in their attempt to kill the goddess of democracy as a newborn infant in her cradle. But this coming of darkness proves only that they have reached the end of their road. The day of their doom has already arrived. They will be judged by all the people. At this grim moment, what we need most is to remain calm and united in a single purpose. We need a powerful cementing force to strengthen our resolve. That is the goddess of democracy. 
Democracy, how long it is since we last saw you. You are the hope for which we thirst, we Chinese, who have suffered decades of repression under the feudal autocracy. You are the symbol of every student in the square, of the hearts of millions of people. You are the soul of the 1989 democracy movement. You are the Chinese nation's hope for salvation. Today, here in the People's Square, the people's goddess stands tall and announces to the whole world, a consciousness of democracy has awakened among the Chinese people. The new era has begun. From this piece of ancient earth grows the tree of democracy and freedom, putting forth gorgeous flowers and a bountiful harvest of fruit. The statue of the goddess of democracy is made of plaster and, of course, cannot stand here forever. But as the symbol of the people's hearts, she is divine and inviolate. Let those who would sully her beware. The people will not permit this. We believe strongly that this darkness will pass, that the dawn must come. On the day when real democracy and freedom come to China, we must erect another goddess of democracy here in the square, monumental, towering, and permanent. We have strong faith that that day will come at last. We have still another hope. Chinese people, arise. Erect the statue of the goddess of democracy in your millions of hearts. Long live the people. Long live freedom. Long live democracy. The statement was signed by the eight art academies that had sponsored the whole project. The Central Academies of Fine Arts, Arts and Crafts, Drama and Music, the Beijing Film Academy, the Beijing Dance Academy, the Academy of Chinese Local Stage Arts, and the Academy of Chinese Music. Part 14, The Unveiling. When the time came for the actual unveiling, two Beijing residents, a woman and a man, were chosen at random from the crowd and invited into the circle to pull the strings that would remove the pieces of red and blue cloth. As these veils fell, the crowd burst into cheers. There were shouts of long live democracy and other slogans, and some began to sing the Internationale. A musical performance was given by students from the Central Academy of Music, choral renditions of the Hymn to Joy from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, another foreign song, and one Chinese, and finally the Internationale again. A planned performance by students in the Central Academy of Dance had to be canceled, since with the pressure of the crowd, there was not enough room for them to dance. Part 15. I stood there with a huge crowd gazing up at this 10 meter high work. It was scarcely a masterpiece of world sculpture. Made in three days and nights by a group of undergraduate students, it could hardly have been that. And yet, it was the greatest sculpture I had ever seen, and the ceremony had been the greatest I had ever attended. Uh, and here I interject. One thing about the goddess sculpture that I haven't seen mentioned anywhere is that the young sculptors apparently put some flammable stuff on top of the torch and ignited it. One can see it burning uh, with an orange flame in one of the photos. I can't say what it was, and I only mean to call attention to it. This must have been part of the unveiling and presentation ceremony to make it even more impressive, the flame of enlightenment and democracy burning before their eyes. We have to remember that this was a collaborative creation, and one of them may have had this good idea that the others went along with. Next, part 16. After the unveiling ceremony, we returned to the Central Academy. I invited all the young sculptors to lunch, but they said, we still have a few hundred yuan from the money that had been given them for the statue, that is, and they treated me instead. At lunch, I asked about their backgrounds and learned that several were the children of, or nephews of older sculptors whom I knew, my colleagues. Hearing this, they asked me, should we call you auntie then instead of older sister? The lunch was short because they soon left one by one, saying that what they needed was not food but sleep. They had not slept for four days. I thought, these young people are the future of China. Why can't Deng Xiaoping appreciate the youth of his own country? They had made themselves special t-shirts and caps as mementos, white with a red V for victory. 
The shirts were later reproduced in quantities and sold, but only 15 or 20 of the caps were made, and they gave me one for being their older sister companion and the one who would tell their story. During the early evening on that day, there was a strong wind and rainstorm. We rushed to the square afterwards to see if the statue had been damaged, but it had endured this first serious test without harm. We took that as a good omen. We were wrong. Part 17. On the terrible night of June 3rd to 4th, I was out around the square for some 40 hours without sleep. That is another story. Afterwards, I could no longer go on living of the Central Academy. It was too dangerous, and most of the students and faculty had fled when I returned there the day after the massacre. But I found a few of the sculpture students and quickly questioned them about matters to do with the planning and making of the statue that were not clear to me. Before, there had seemed to be no urgency about getting the whole story. Now there was. This, that was the laugh that I saw of them. They were frightened with good reason, and they dispersed to safer places. I have not heard anything about any of them since then. Here I interject. The photos you are seeing were taken by Shingran during the following night and day. Her accounts of what she experienced uh, and saw and endured during those 40 hours in Beijing, as she titles her narrative, are harrowing and revealing. What the outside world didn't realize was that much of the terrible wounding and killing wasn't going on in the square. Most of the student leaders had been permitted to leave through an entrance to the underground at the far end, but rather among the thousands of Beijing people, young and older, who had come out that night to stand around the square and try to keep the students from being killed. Instead, they themselves were confronted by soldiers with rifles who shot into the crowds to keep them back and forced them to disperse. While the people of Beijing kept saying to them things like, Chinese soldiers don't shoot Chinese people. You are worse than the Japanese. Xingran was among them and was shot at and saw people around her fall and be carried away. She managed somehow to make her way back to the Central Academy, to the Beijing Hotel, and eventually to the airport, where she was fortunate enough to get on a plane carrying U.S. citizens with their dependent to Japan. And from there she came home. All this is related at length in her chronicles. But let me read the final page of her Birth of Goddess essay. The toppling of the Goddess of Democracy, the final heart-rending symbolic event, was seen by millions of TV viewers. Pushed by a tank, it fell forward and to the right, so that its hands and the torch struck the ground first, breaking off. It must have been quickly and easily reduced to rubble, mixing with all the other rubble in the square, to be cleared away by the army as part of its deceitful show of cleanliness and order. The statue, however, could not be so easily destroyed. As the unveiling statement had said, it was intended from the beginning to be ephemeral, and yet to endure as an image of the desire of the great mass of Chinese people for the ideals it symbolized, liberty and democracy. Replicas of it have already been made, or are planned, by Chinese student groups and others in the U.S. and elsewhere who want them to be a lasting reminder. Like the writers of the statement, I myself envision a day when another replica as large as the original and more permanent stands in Tiananmen Square with the names of those who died there written in gold on its base. It may well stand there after Chairman Mao's mausoleum has in its turn been pulled down. End of Xingran's Chronicle. Indeed, quite a few replicas and derivatives of the goddess have been made, and I'll show a few of those that I took off the internet. One, seen here, was made soon after Xingran got back, with her as an advisor, by a sculptor named Thomas Marsh, to be set up in Portsmouth Square in San Francisco's Chinatown. This one is in bronze, and is fairly true to the original. Next. Others, of which I pulled blurry images off the internet, include these at Arlington, Virginia, and at York University in Canada. One of them seen here was at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, located in a stairwell, 
but it was evidently pulled down or destroyed. Next. Another is seen in this photo was made by a sculptor at the same Chinese University of Hong Kong, but with alterations, only one arm raised, the other downward holding a tablet, like Moses. And she stands straight, upright. Next. This one, which appears to be a faithful reproduction of the original, is appropriately at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I say appropriately because that's where Xing Yuan Chao still teaches as a professor of Chinese art history. And she must have been involved somehow in its recreation. She and I are long separated, and I can only guess. I will conclude with a few notes on in the aftermath. I put on this photo of Frieda Mert, distinguished scholar of Chinese art history, who for many years had been living in Beijing with her husband, to relate an incident that happened while she was still a graduate student at Princeton, and how she helped us. We were back in Berkeley, and Shingran received a telephone call from her old sculpture teacher, who had come to the U.S. and was living in Detroit, telling her that he had seen in a newspaper article that a Chinese man who had graduated from the Central Academy with a sculpture degree had turned up in New York claiming to be the sculptor of the goddess, and there was going to be a ceremony honoring him in which the mayor of New York would present him with some kind of award or medal. All this was announced in the newspaper article. Xing Yuan's old teacher asked if she could somehow stop this, expose him. We ourselves couldn't fly to New York to attend that event, but we phoned Frieda Merck and told her about it, and she and other Princeton grad students in Chinese art did go to New York and confront the pretender, saying that if they went through with the ceremony, she and the others would rise up and loudly proclaim the truth. So the award ceremony was indeed canceled. Before that, the sculptor's wife, a German art historian from Heidelberg, I won't name her, uh, phoned Shing to plead with her that we, were, that we should not go through with this and offering incentives if Xing Yuan and I would come over to their side. But of course we didn't, and the false sculptor was suitably discredited. I have no idea where he is now. Next. This is an image that I took from the New York Times on June 4th this year showing the candlelight vigil that I mentioned before that is held in Hong Kong every year to commemorate the event. It's somehow combined with an image of the goddess confronting Chairman Mao in front of the Forbidden City in Tiananmen Square. The story and all the images make up what I firmly believe is the most profoundly moving and altogether greatest interaction of artistic creation with historical events in our time. And the terrible irony of it is that the original work of art itself is long destroyed, its pieces hauled away to the dump, and the artists who made it dispersed. They can't be identified now, and they don't want to be for their own safety. We have, that is, what is in its way a great work of art that is now only an image, created by artists who have disappeared into obscurity instead of enjoying the prominence that they deserve. I hope that this lecture, clumsy and inadequate as it has been in many ways, will help to ensure the permanence of that image and preserve the moving story of what these first-year sculpture students somehow accomplished in three days and nights, starting with no model, no materials, no clear direction, only a strong sense of mission and a belief in how they could affect the future of China, as indeed they have even if we have to wait a while for it to happen. But it will happen, and I hope that I will still be alive to see it. That's all for this lecture, which I sign verbally as transcriber of Xing'an's account and the relator of the whole great story, James Cahill.